Male and female brains, then. Did you know that currently there are only six women in charge of the biggest 100 companies in the British Isles today? Such a small figure, it's outnumbered by the number of male chief executives who are called Steve. <laughs> the world is full of gender gaps. And where do those gender gaps come from? Across the world, we see all sorts of different gender gaps in achievement, in political involvement, uh, in education. So we really need to ask ourselves, what is it that's causing these gaps? Blame the brain has been a very popular mantra. Men and women obviously have different brains. Presumably those Steves at the top of their game have got more efficient uh, brains, uh, certainly bigger brains, of course, uh, than the Angelas and Zoes scrabbling around in the, in the lower reaches of their, of their organisation. But we need to remember that this story started well before we even had access to the brain. So let's have a look and see what kind of story uh, has been devised about the brain and how female brains and male brains get to be different. This is what I call the, the biological, biology's destiny pathway. The fact that male brains and female brains arrive in the world slightly different. If we track the pathway of the male brain, it gets bigger and bigger, acquires all those necessary skills and resilience to make them uh, Nobel Prize winning scientists or explorers, etc. Female brain, slightly more fragile, perhaps not with the uh, necessary skills that would allow her to be hugely financially or scientifically successful, but she does arrive at the, at the developmental end point as um, a very emotionally perceptive individual, perhaps a bit emotionally labile, but full of all of the characteristics necessary to make her, and I quote, a um, womanly companion of man and a good wife and mother. So these were the kind of stories that we were looking at um, when we were actually uh, going back into the 18th, 19th century. Before they could look at the brain, there was a clear message. Men and women have got different anatomies. This must involve their brains. Their brains um, unfold, uh, some kind of biological script inevitably unfolding, reaching a fixed, hardwired endpoint. Men's brains were different from men's, women's brains, and there was no um, way in which you could change that story, and that explained how society evolved. But remember, as I said, that these stories about the brain were based before we could even access the brain. So what happened once wonderful brain images like these could be produced at the end of the, uh, end of the last century in the 1990s onwards? And we can see the kind of images here, very, very compelling, looking as though we had at last made the invisible visible. We could see the structures, the pathways, look at where different patterns of activation were placed on those structures. And all at once, there was an explosion of really excited research, which was going back to this question about men's and women's brains being different. But I have to say, echoing the hunt the difference of gender of our early brain scientists who couldn't even look at brains, the 20th century brain scientists weren't really asking a question. They were just saying men's and women's brains, of course they're different. They've got all sorts of different skills. So let's find that difference. And we had a big wash of really important research papers, uh, always with something like sex differences in the brain in X, um, big special issues, lots and lots of studies showing that you know, looking at larger and larger groups of people, there were sex differences in the brain. And there were firm statements from individuals about the fundamental sex differences they'd proved. So at last, the truth. And the media were very interested in this, and always you got big headlines, and they all started, at last the truth, proof at last, as though, you know, scientists had at last caught up with what everybody knew all along. And I will wash over the why, uh, why Men Don't Cry and Women Can't Read Maps type of books, um, and of course the Mars and Venus, uh, which I have apparently slanderously dismissed as neurotrash. But they do still inform our belief about the brains. And people said, yes, of course, if we now look at the research body, we can see that there's lots and lots of proof. 
But actually, things aren't quite as they seemed. If we look very carefully um, at each of those different studies, several things emerge. First of all, although it looks like there's lots and lots of papers proving differences, when you look at them individually, quite often they're talking about different differences. So somebody will say, uh, men have got a bigger structure X. Very often it's phrased in that way for particular reasons. Um, whereas other people will say, oh, I looked at structure X and it was exactly the same in men and women, but I found that men have got a bigger structure Y. And so the story unfolded. And then so it looked as though we had lots and lots of proof really that story didn't quite hold up. And it was also the case that the scientists who made firm statements about fundamental sex differences forgot to really emphasize the fact that the differences we're looking at in brains or in the behavior that we think is supported by those brains are very, very tiny. The variability within groups of males and within groups of females is much bigger than the tiny difference between them, but we spend all our time focusing on those differences. And it's also the case, because of how research publication works, that again, if you look at those papers, there's many, many incidents where the brains are much more similar than they are different. But that often doesn't get into the title of the paper or even into the abstract, if the paper even gets published. So another type of, at last, the truth sort of message is that as a neuroscientist, I have to stand up in front of you today and say, I do not know the difference between a male and a female brain. You couldn't give me a brain and say, is that from a man or is that from a woman? I couldn't confidently point at a brain image and say, that's a woman doing this or that's a man doing that. So the kind of story that has emerged that men and, brains, men and women's brains are different hasn't as yet stood up to the test of quite as, a, an intense onslaught by these hunt the difference researchers. But we still have gender gaps. So where do they come from? Has 21st century neuroscience got anything useful to say about where these differences come from? Is it something we should be paying more attention to? Should we new new neuroscientists come out from under our scanners and have a look at the world around us and see could that be changing the brains uh, of male males and females in interesting ways? The first thing we need to realize is that our brains are wired to make us social. We have an amazing array of cognitive skills, linguistic, creative, scientific, musical, which appears to have been the secret of human beings' success. But actually, if we look at the way the brain has evolved and we compare it with our success, it looks as though being social is a much more important role that our brain has to play. Human beings are the most social of all creatures. Generally speaking, we have many more social groups, wider social groups. We have a clear sense of social identity. We have a clear understanding of the social rules of engagement for our in-groups. We also identify out-groups. And we have nice little stereotypes, uh, which are useful cognitive, stere uh, cognitive shortcuts, demonstrating that men are like this and women are like that, and we interact with them accordingly. The other thing we need to realize is that this all starts very early. We used to think that human babies arriving into the world as apparently highly efficient noise or excreta producing machines actually were rather patronizingly referred to as like subcortical, being rather helpless. But human beings, human being babies, we now know arrive in the world with hugely finely tuned social antennae. They like tiny social sponges. And their brains are working very hard right from the beginning, picking up social cues from the world around them. Within hours, they're responding differently to faces or face-like stimuli than to scrambled images. Within days, they're responding differently to their native language than to languages from another country. Our little tiny babies are, as I say, tiny little social sponges quickly noting is what's going on around us. So what else does our, do we know in the 21st century which says how does our brain harness and drive that particular uh, purpose of the brain to make us social? And this brings me to the three Ps. First of all, our brains are predictive coders. We always used to think the brains were a bit like um, wonderful uh, computer-type machines which processed any information that came to them, which they do. They are hugely efficient. 
But we now know that our brains are also making future predictions, that actually what our brains do is quickly take us through the world via lots of shortcuts, lots of guesses. When you see that uh, sight or you hear that sound, that's what's probably going to happen. Don't pay too much attention to it. We've got much more important things to do. And it's slightly alarming, you might think, that we're actually being driven around the world by a guessing machine. But actually, usually, the brain is highly efficient. And this is the kind of work that I've been doing in, in, in my lab with my team, where we can track the backwards and forwards uh, relaying of information from a brain, sees a particular site, sends an uh, a prediction about it to the front of the brain, where it's uh, the other parts of the behavior are processed, and it says, yes, that was a correct guess. Carry on with that particular way of, of steering your owner through the world. And you can see very neat forward and backward pathways. This is not just about sights and sounds, it's also about social skills. If you think about it, if you see an image like that, there does need to be some kind of context taken into account. Is this person waving to me, or is he about to slap me around the face? I probably need to remember uh, last time I saw him doing something like this, something whatever happened, I need to know the social context, I need to remember the person. So our brains are predictive coders, a bit like sat-navs, driving us around the world and, and keeping us out of trouble. We also need to realize that our brains are plastic, that they respond throughout our lives to the kind of experiences that we have, and that we really need to know that this isn't just true of baby brains, it's true th of all the experiences we have. So the events and, and experiences we have will change our brains throughout our life. If we're a taxi driver the bits of, and doing the knowledge in London, the bits of the brain responsible for that will get larger as we acquire the knowledge. Interestingly, once we retire, those differences will disappear. If we have a look at um, what looks like spatial uh, sex differences in particular kinds of ability, they look like innate ones because they're always, men do much better on spatial tasks than women. But actually, if we take into account different kinds of spatial experiences that individuals have had, have they played with construction toys as a child? And the bottom image here is to show that, for example, if you want to improve somebody's spatial skills and overcome a sex difference, just give them three months of intensive Tetris training. They will, uh, their brains will change and also they will be better at spatial tasks. So what looks like a sex difference is in fact not a sex difference. Similarly, our brains are permeable. They're not just information processing systems, um, impermeable, uh, it which are unaware of the kind of social information around them. They will solve a problem in the context in which it has been presented. If we say to somebody, this is a task that people like you are good at, I'd like to see what happens to your brain, we get a different pattern of activity and a different performance from somebody that we say, this is a, a, a particular task which people like you are good at, I'd like to see what happens in the scanner. And you can see that the brain is different depending on the social context. We also know that um, uh, actually causing people to ha suffer some kind of deficit in self-esteem, which unfortunately gives a, a bad impression of me, uh, is something I spend a lot of time uh, making my participants feel bad. Um, <laughs> involve them with a, a rigged video game where they're continuously excluded by the other players. Make them think about a really bad mistake they made and how much it was their fault. And we can see that this changes particular parts of the brain. And what's important is that those parts of the brain which are activated when somebody makes a mistake are actually the same parts of the brain which are activated by real pain. So social mistakes, a lack of belonging, a feeling that you've been rejected are actually really powerful negative drivers in the brain. Okay, so we have these wonderful brains which aren't just focusing what's going on inside, solving problems irrespective of what's going on around us. This brings us to the conclusion that the world is a brain influencer, that what's going on outside the brain, we should be looking at, both neuroscientists like me and perhaps all of you contemplating that. We should say, is there any possibility that our world is just a tiny bit gendered? Could it be that these plastic, permeable, uh, predictive brains are being exposed to different experiences, different stories, different attitudes and expectations.
I could leave that there and think, leave you to mentally wander around your own hometown, or your own city, your own supermarket, open a, a, a newspaper and say, hmm, I think we might just live in a gendered world. Just briefly to share with you some of my views about this, I think nothing in the 21st century indicates most powerfully how we have become a much more gendered society. We are continuously bombarded by information about gender. And I don't know if you're aware of the existence of gender reveal parties, where 20 weeks before a baby even arrives in the world, a scan will pretty reliably demonstrate that it's going to be a boy or a girl, cue for a huge party uh, where you can release blue balloons or pink balloons, eat blue uh, cakes or pink cakes, and have different kinds of um, congratulatory messages if it's a boy as opposed to if it's a girl. So this society really codes this difference importantly. And the pink or blue tsunami that washes over tiny babies when they eventually arrive is another powerful code. Toys. I've already mentioned the importance of construction toys. Who gets to play with Lego um, and who gets to play with a princess doll? If any of you are involved in schools, you might like to wander around those schools or sit in on a lesson and just see how stereotyped those, those, uh, that environment is for those tiny little developing brains. Seven-year-olds, already dif differences in self-esteem between the girls and the boys. The school environment full of, of cues, clues that boys and girls are different. Science is another very good case study. We have uh, an indication that there's a big underrepresentation of women in science. They seem to be cognitively uh, able. In fact, very often they're more cognitively, uh, cognitively able, but they don't choose to do science. Could it be that the science, uh, science's culture is actually saying to the social brain of that girl, actually, this person isn't going to be welcome? We're going to have members of our society standing up and saying that, for example, Google shouldn't be wasting its money on training women scientists um, because biologically they're really not up to the job. So let's, in the final minutes, go back to this biology is destiny pathway. Is biology, the internal biology, the unfolding of this biological script, this genotype, the only thing we need to look at to understand how brains get to be different? The other thing we need to remember is that all of these is the idea that our brains are fixed at the end, that you can't do anything about it. So my feeling is that we need to look outside our world. We need to understand that our world is just as brain changing as any kind of genotype or hormonal marinade. And just to show you um, wonderful insight that six year olds have, we need to remember that everybody's brain is attached to the world. And if that world is gendered and offers our brain different experiences, different attitudes, then that will change our brain. So we are looking at the unfolding of a biological script, but it's a biological script on a social stage. And excuse the extension of the metaphor, it's a, an end product, the end of the story is determined much more by the other players and even perhaps by the scenery on the stage than we were ever aware of. So the take home message is very much a gendered world produces a gendered brain. Thank you.